Welcome to the Half Percent Podcast. My name is Nick Plosser. Each episode is an in-depth interview with a member of our military, whether active duty, reserve, or vet. If you or anybody you know would like to be a guest, please reach out and contact me, Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, the Half Percent Podcast. This show is available anywhere you listen to podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Ricochet Podcast Network, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, all of the above. Please subscribe, write us that five-star review, and make us part of your feed. And finally, I want to thank everybody for listening. Really appreciate your time. And with that, let's get into the show. Okay, Mr. Push-Ups, let's hear your story. It's not just the uniform. It's the stories that you tell. So much fun and imagination. From now on, you will speak only when spoken to. And the first and last words out of your filthy sewers will be served. Do you maggots understand that? All right, welcome back to the Half Percent Podcast. My guest today is Bryce Morrison. Bryce, thanks for joining, man. Absolutely. Happy to be here. All right, so let's get right into it. Bryce, you were in the Navy for how long? Why don't you go ahead and uh, give, a, give a little background bio uh, and kind of why you joined the Navy? I was in for 11 years. I joined in 1991 began uh, boot camp in Orlando, Florida. Yes, Navy had a boot camp in Orlando, Florida. I was gonna, I was gonna say, that's not yeah. a bad place to do boot camp, man. Yeah, I, I called it summer camp, even though I started in December. Um, <laughs> because uh, afterward, you know, I got to talking to all of the people who went through Chicago boot camp, or Waukegan, or I guess North Chicago, Illinois. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they have the horror stories about the four feet of snow and things like that. And uh, we never had any of that. We had rain every afternoon at three. That's about it. Yeah, winter in Orlando, man. That's, uh, those, there are worse <laughs> places to do it, man. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so where now where are you from originally? Uh, well, that's the funny thing. I was Navy born and bred. So okay. my father was career Navy as well. I was born in Meridian, Mississippi, but I know nothing about it. Um, okay, right. Because from... As early as I can remember, I lived in Texas, okay. South Texas. Uh, I started out in Kingsville, elementary school age, and then middle school got up to, uh, uh, actually, I guess it was still elementary into middle school. I was in Corpus Christi, Texas, mm -hmm. and I went to school in Flower Bluff, which was at that time the number one school in the nation. And then uh, in seventh grade, got transferred to Waukegan, Illinois. That's okay. why I slipped up earlier and said Waukegan because it's right there by North Chicago. And uh, Waukegan, Illinois, I became a minority. And uh, right. I also was about two years ahead of the school at that time. And so, and I also dressed like a, a, a real southern nerd. Right. <laughs> so I wore bell bottoms and boots and uh, I just did not fit in at all. And the first day of school, I got a bloody nose. Right. So I had to grow up real quick at seventh grade. And yep. uh, that changed the course of my growth very quickly. Okay. And then, so you stayed, you stayed in Illinois until into, into high school? Absolutely. Uh, oh. I finished up high school in Waukegan, Illinois, and when I graduated, I immediately went into the Navy. Followed my father's career path. So, what did your dad? What did your dad do? And what was his job in the Navy? So he was uh, a tradesman, which their their letters were TD. So everybody was very fond of them and called them toy doctors. <laughs> Because uh, all he ever did was work on training uh, apparatus. So okay. in his case, primarily, he worked on the aircraft trainers. So in the 20-plus years of Navy service, my father never set foot on a, on a ship until he went on a Tiger cruise while I was in the Navy long <laughs> after his career was over. Join the Navy, never get on a boat, right? Yes, I, I tried that path. It didn't work for me. It didn't, didn't work out for you. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, so, um, and then so you knew you wanted to go in the Navy. Did you ever consider, consider uh, the other branches? Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I was going into the Air Force. Okay. My brother had gone into the Air Force, and I was going to go into the Air Force. And my dad just was not having it, and he kept going, no, you need to go into the Navy. And he went to his buddies, you know, because he was still connected at that time 
he was civil service by then, but uh, he was working on the base. And he went to all his buddies and he said, what's going on? Where, where should he go? What's the best path? And he got me into a program. We called it Push Button. And uh, I went in at a little bit higher rank, so a little more pay, and right. then very quickly got moved up to be able to have uh, a higher ranking all through gas turbine electrician because I signed up to be uh, six years. So, oh, right. So you took a little bit longer uh, initial signing. Exactly. And I got a bonus to go in as well. So, you know, all of that, all of the perks. He talked me into it, bribed me with money. Hey, so I became well, Navy. A- the best it's the best thing to be bribed with man yeah <laughs> you got you got to do it that's a reason to do it uh, well so he you... did trick me though <laughs> oh, okay. because he said gas turbine electrician and i right. said oh electricity i can do electricity i like electricity i like right. math i was a glorified mechanic okay <laughs> <laughs> well they do all put they all they always put acronyms on things and euphemisms uh, yeah. in describing the jobs right yeah, absolutely. And I, I did have to know electricity and I, I had to know quite a bit. Um, but the truth is the foundation of a gas turbine electrician is you do have to understand gas turbine engines and all of the mechanics that go along with that. And I just did not have that. I, I wasn't born with that gene. I did OK, but uh, the mechanical part of it was always challenging for me. Right. Okay. Well, at least you uh, you kind of knew the area you were going into when you got in, I guess. You didn't just <laughs> go show up at the recruiter and say, I'll put me somewhere, you know? Yeah, <laughs> that's a, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's at least a step up. So, um, okay, so you, you, you joined right out of high school, um, and you did your boot camp in Orlando. And um, what do you, anything that sticks out from, uh, from basic training boot camp? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I also happen to have uh, – been married right before I went to boot camp and had a child on the way. Okay. And my child was going to be born while I was in boot camp, mm. which the the real challenging part, I lived in Waukegan, Illinois, and even though there was a, a recruit training center right there, in the Navy's wisdom, they didn't think I should be close to my recruit training command, so they sent me all the way to Orlando, Florida. Mm-hmm. So I knew that I was going to be in boot camp and miss my first child's birth. That sucks. So we, uh, I started December, uh, I can't remember, I think it was December 3rd. Um, and of course, Christmas Eve. We had already been deprived of sleep and we'd been, uh, you know, abused both (laughs) mentally and physically. And all of a sudden these uh, company commanders come in on Christmas Eve and they've had us writing letters all day to family and things of that nature, you know, getting us thinking about family. And they come in in the evening and they tell us we need to stand in a circle. And we're like, okay, yeah, we'll do that. Are we gonna are we gonna have to do more push ups? You know, what's what's going on? No, they decided to play uh, Lee Greenwood, God bless the USA. Oh, okay. And um, I don't know how familiar you are with that song. Oh but, yeah, of uh, course, of course. It's it's kind of uh, it's very patriotic. It's very yep. much about family and and how why you know we care so much about our country and our family that's right and you had 20 plus individuals standing in a circle that are supposed to be grown men i don't care you know there were people of all ages in there i I guess you know within certain limits that's right but uh we were all bawling you know none of us could complete you know we were supposed to be singing (laughs) <laughs> and nobody could sing the entire song. It, you know, we were just broken emotionally, and yeah, and it solidified, you know, why we were there. But uh, we were all thinking about our own reasons. For me, it was the fact that I was going to miss my child's birth, and here it was Christmas Eve, and I missed all my family, and yeah, right, right. It was I, br- I was broken. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that's a whoever came up with that idea, whichever one of your drill instructors came up with that idea, knew what he was about. Oh yeah. So, and then you mentioned, uh, uh, and you had an announcement in February of 92 that, that, uh, was, uh, I thought was pretty cool as well. 
I actually for a while had the video. I you know the problem with VHS tapes is they right. they degrade over time. But and I, and I didn't get to it in time to be able to transfer it to modern media. But what happened? Um, you know we were approaching the end of our boot camp and we were invited able slash able to go to a USO show. Mm -hmm. And uh, we show up at the USO show and, you know, we're all in our dress uniforms and very proud of who we were. And, you know, we've made it this far. We're about to graduate. And um, and we sit down and and we're allowed to be kind of be ourselves for the first time in weeks. And we're hooping and hollering and, you know, the Orlando Magic cheerleaders come out there and everybody's nice. cheering for them because, you know, we haven't seen a woman. In... I was going to say, you guys have been with... <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, at that time, there was no co -ed. It was just men. And, um, you know, there, there were ladies' uh, com companies, but... Uh, for the most part, it was it was all guys. So we see these cheerleaders, and we're we're excited. As and um, it was very loud, raise the roof kind of loud. And then uh, a few minutes later, after another act or two, um, this gentleman comes out. He was one of the MCs, and he says, uh, "Is there a seaman recruit Morrison with us this evening?" And, uh, you know, of course, I go, "Yeah, that's me." And I stand up, and he says. Uh, We'd, we'd like to share with everyone the fact that Seaman Recruit Morrison is now a proud father. Nice. To Blake Alexander Morrison. And, uh, you know, of course, again, I lost it. I, I tried not to, you know. I, right. I, didn't, I didn't ball, but uh, the tears were rolling. No and, question, um, man. No question. And the greatest part about it, and again, I did have evidence for a while, but the greatest part about it was the fact that at that point, it was even louder. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone was so, it, it, it felt good. What a great memory, man. That's awesome, dude. Did, and as your, as your, uh, did you, was, did anybody record that? Yeah. Like I said, they, they videotaped it. Nice. It was, it was not public, you know, the video was not a public it wasn't given out but i asked them i begged them practically to let me have the video and they said well of course you know it, it's a big deal we'll let you have our recording of it and um and i had it for a long time but uh it, it just didn't make it didn't survive did your son see it as he got older he did um it, as a matter of fact he talks about it sometimes and he says you know i i don't remember being born so it wasn't that big of a deal to me but the fact that i get to say the you know that i get to tell the story of all these sailors yelling louder for me than the orlando magic cheerleaders <laughs> that's pretty big deal so he's he's happy so i feel that's, better <laughs> that's cool man that's a great story man awesome story very cool um so then uh okay so basics done uh you get transferred up to norfolk and and uh start your job yeah training for your job no actually um i got transferred back to great lakes because oh, okay. i had to go to school all right and i was there for a few years uh going through several schools a school e, uh, c school and um and i i did actually get quite a bit of uh praise there i struggled with the mechanics as expected but uh i aced the mathematics and some of the electronics first aid and so I, I did pretty well, and I actually was given priority on choices of where to go. And I kept looking at it going, I don't want to go to any of these places. Right. And, you know, because it was a little different for me because I actually already had a family. So I was struggling with the decision, and I took too long. And they said, okay, you're going to the USS San Jacinto out of Norfolk, Virginia. Which was probably, for everybody at that time, that was like the last choice. Nobody wanted to go to Norfolk. Uh, it was either, let's go to West Coast or let's go overseas. Right. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm actually very, very happy that it happened in the long run. I was very proud to serve on the USS San Jacinto. I, it's, it was an amazing ship. We won all kinds of awards. I had amazing... Uh, mentors on board that changed my career path 
for a very positive way. And it's uh, so. it's amazing how many people I talk to, and then you know my own experience in life on things that initially you look at and you go, "Damn, I don't really want to do that." And yep. it's and how they end up being some of the most valuable lessons you end up learning are because of those things. I, it's so common with so many people I've talked to, not just in the service but in life. You know, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So then, okay. So then, how long? Uh, how long were you in with? with how does that work? You were, how long were you in Norfolk and how long were you with it? You were assigned to the San Jacinto and then how long were you with that ship? So I got there in 1994 um, and immediately, almost immediately went out on a six month cruise. And, uh, and then I had one other six month cruise and in 19, I think it was somewhere around 1998. Um, I was due for a four month, what we all labeled a pleasure cruise. Okay. It was supposed to go into the Baltics and we were going to get to go to Amsterdam Ooh, and all these cool places. It's a beautiful part of the world, the Baltics. Man. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and just before we were supposed to leave, we found out that our sister ship did not qualify and we were sent back out to the Red Sea during, you know, all of the, there were things going on as always in that area absolutely though, right? and so instead of four months pleasure cruise in the baltics i spent I, I, somewhere around eight or nine visits to dubai united arab emirates so that's that was what i was going to ask you you mentioned two six months uh uh trips and then were you in, mainly in the middle east in that time did you go to asia where where where, where did that take you yeah the first two, two trips were both Com almost completely Mediterranean. We, okay. we spent most of those two going to France, Italy, England, Spain, great places. Yeah, not too and, bad. Um, and that third six-month cruise that was supposed to be the Baltics, we spent the entire time in the Middle East, Dubai. Uh, we really didn't have much time anywhere else at all. What and, and these these things are just kind of port of call visits, uh, flying the flag. Uh, do, what what exactly are you doing at that time? I'm glad you asked that. It's I, I've actually had some conversations with some people that uh, have a real misunderstanding of what we do when we're overseas. Uh huh. There, I, uh, one individual said to me, you know, I don't understand why we have to always be at war overseas and the truth is it couldn't be further from that that's right we're actually pulling into ports and i i actually was given certificates for some of the volunteer work that i did you know we helped to do gardening at missions and or at churches and uh we went to schools and and read to kids and just all kinds of different things. Yeah. Every chance we got, we tried to help people in other countries recognize that we're there on diplomacy. You know, we're there to to just be able to help them in any way we can and let them know that the United States is their friend. Yep, absolutely. It's it's an interesting when I, I lived over in Southeast Asia for quite a while, and um, you know, you know how much uh, you you know, uh, but most people don't is is how much our Navy guarantees the our Navy and Air Force guarantee the safety of a lot of those shipping lanes where seventy eighty percent of the world's goods go through, and um, and you know whether it's the Middle East or the Straits of Malacca or any of those places, and so uh, that's why I wanted to have you talk a little bit about that because you know people think you're just going there flying the flag just to be a swinging dick and that's that but really it's you know there's 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 real purpose to that and it's 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 quite the opposite of what the person you talked to said so it's to do that so we avoid the war <laughs> you know what i mean it's exactly. to show it's to show that we're, we're we're paying attention and that uh you know the strong horse is paying attention I, you know if i can insert my own little views in there but I, that's why i wanted you to talk about it because you've actually done that so well and you know it, it definitely is us being there to help the citizens recognize that we are good people and, yep. and that we're around. But there are also military objectives. Of course. There were plenty of times that we had to rush through the canal and get over there and let Saddam Hussein know that we were paying attention. Right. You know, there's there's things of that nature. Mm -hmm. The the rest of the world, not all of them have good intentions and they pay attention to what we're doing. And if, that's for if sure. they think that we're not paying attention, then they may try to do something that's not noble. 
For sure, for sure. Did you uh, now? Did you get it? Did you have to deal where you were in the Middle East? Did you deal with any of the Somali pirate issues, or was that a little bit before that time where it was really an issue? Or we actually did have some some situations where we had to do some boardings, and we actually had a rescue at one point with a fire. It, we, there's there's all kinds of different situations and scenarios that we've been involved with. We did drug ops uh, down in the uh, Caribbean. Mm -hmm. uh, just yeah, I, we we do a lot of different things, and and there were people on board that were heavily trained in arms, and mm -hmm. you know yeah. <laughs> well, I was no, I was yeah, I was I was initially in 2004. I was on the path to go into the Marines for uh, you know to go into. Marine Corps for a, a, a for a career and uh, the the staff sergeant that was I was talking to was like you know there's a lot of inner inner uh, branch rivalry oh, yeah. and, and ribbing and all that and he just said but remember at the end of the day that we don't get anywhere unless the Navy takes us so uh, don't need to <laughs> <laughs> he's like we have to hitch a ride with them everywhere we go so um, but yeah th that th that's um, I've read a few books on on naval missions and it just blew me away the, how much, how many different things we ask our Navy to do around the world. Um, it's not just, you know, steaming along and, and firing guns off. There's just a lot of stuff. And so that's why I was curious uh, from your, from your experience, what you did out there, because it's just, I know there's, I mean, anything and everything from tsunami relief to, you know, from, like you said, uh, the gardening missions to teaching to, it's just a chance. Those are movable cities, man. And they're, and they're a chance to, uh, project diplomacy more than anything as well as power but diplomacy as well so that's why i was curious absolutely you know i, I live in a community uh, i'm in a luxury rv park and uh there's a lot of retirees here and a whole lot of military members mm -hmm. and uh i'm kind of outnumbered here there's a lot of marines <laughs> and um we i was just at the pool the other day and and i was talking to one of the marines and uh you know he called me this and i called him that and and at the end of it, you know, it was, we were laughing and I, I said, just remember, you know, when you're on that battlefield, who's going to stitch you up? That's right. Because that's the Navy. Yep. The the Marines don't have any medical. It's the <laughs> Navy that takes care of you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we, you're right. We do a lot. Yeah. It's, it's, it all, and it all works together at the end of the day, of course. I just, that's the whole point of it that, uh, but I was just, yeah, like I said, I read a book about a couple of years ago about the, about uh, you know, a, a writer had gone along with a couple of Navy ships through the Middle East for a year and then Southeast Asia for a year and with the seventh fleet, I think. And so, um, it was just amazing to me how much, how many ports of call of all the different things that they, you know, those, those, those things are, those carriers and ships are, you know, like I said, movable cities. It's pretty incredible. We also have to be our own firefighters too. That's right. That's right. Everything. Yep. Um, so, okay, so you mentioned you, you did those trips, and then um, eventually, now what was next after that, after Norfolk? So, uh, what happens in the, in the military, you have five years at sea, or on a sea command, and then you transfer to shore duty. And um, in 1999, my, my sea duty was up, and I was getting ready to transfer, and I was looking for opportunities. And... Um, they they suggested strongly suggested uh, recruiting, and I didn't feel comfortable with that at that time. In hindsight, I probably would have been excellent at it. I I, I do a lot of sales, so right. I probably would have done well. But um, I actually had grown up with a passion for, uh, I, you know, I I grew up in the era of no. Uh, say no to drugs and, and things of that nature. And right. I, I took that path. I, I kind of stood tall and stood proud to say no. Mm -hmm. And so, and there were some personal experiences that led to that, but I looked at the opportunities and one of them was a substance abuse counselor in Mayport, Florida. And by okay. now my parents had retired to Orlando, well not retired, my dad was still civil service, but they were heading towards retirement in Orlando, Florida. So uh, I said, well, you know, here's an opportunity to get closer to them. And um, it's something that I love. So I transferred to San Diego, California for what we lovingly call mental boot camp. <laughs> and I went through two and a half months of NDAX, Navy mm -hmm. Drug and Alcohol Counselor School, okay. which is world renowned for, for their 
education in that field. Uh, very, very proud of that education. It was, it was definitely mental boot camp. It was powerful. I learned a lot about myself during that time. And then I transferred to Mayport, Florida to be a substance abuse counselor. Dude, I, I was, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm listening to your, to your uh, port to call, man, like Florida, San Diego, <laughs> Europe. <laughs> it's like, you chose some sunny places, man. That's, that's the one thing that Navy does, man. You get, you got some nice deal. That's just down the way from me. So, uh, and I, I love it down there. So that's not a bad place to go if you have to do some schooling. Right. And it was, it was during the cooler months too. So I, I got to enjoy it rather than having to be in Norfolk. <laughs> right. You know? With snow and ice and sleet. Yeah. That's cool, man. So, all right. So then you end up in Mayport, Florida. What's the base down there? Uh, it's Mayport Naval Station. Mayport Naval Station. Yep. Okay, cool. And uh, now there's there's actually like three or four military bases all around Jacksonville, Florida. But okay. uh, Mayport Naval Station is where I was stationed. Okay, and then that was your – now that was – and this is getting towards the end of your career. Is that correct? Yes, unfortunately it was. So you – and, and so you, I know you, you, you mentioned that you had some medical issues. Did you – you would have would you have stayed the career if you could have looking you know at that time absolutely okay all right so t- and so then you what was what were the medical issues that finally convinced you to to uh that uh, discharge you know that that was going to happen for you so while i was on the ship i had started to develop some some challenges with my knees mm-hmm. um actually even all the way back to boot camp i had some foot problems that uh during work week i ended up missing part of it because of my feet but uh we resolved that and i made it and i survived quite a while and then while i was on the ship i started to have some real bad knee problems and um and then i went to i started going to the doctors on board but you know there's no actual on a smaller ship there's no actual doctor it's corman okay and so you know i got vitamin m Mm -hmm. uh motrin for those that are not familiar Right. And, uh, you know, suck it up. Right. So I sucked it up and I did a lot of weight lifting. I, I learned to do, I learned to spend a lot of time in the, in the weight room so that I didn't have to do as much cardio. Right. Um, uh, because running hurt. And so when I transferred to shore duty, I took advantage of it to try to work on figuring out what was wrong. And I, I had several x-rays and MRIs and one of the doctors finally said that he, he took a different type of x-ray called a sunrise, I believe. And it looked at my patella from a different angle and it said, well, you, really, if you were born today, you probably would have had leg br- braces mm. um, growing up to help put your legs where they should have been. So uh, I just didn't know, you know, I, and so the doctors suggested that I could no longer go back out to sea and uh, I sought other opportunities. I tried to tell them, look, you know, look at my scores. My ASVAB was great. I can do any job you want me to do. I'll even do that recruiting thing. Let me stay in. And I fought and I managed to stand for an extra three years beyond when they were, they had begun trying to, to discharge me. And okay. finally I just kind of rolled over and said, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll go. That's it. And, and, uh, so, and then you, there's a, there's a story here where you were, uh, while you were in about uh, being in Plymouth, Engl- England and, uh, <laughs> and a, and a friend named Mad, Mad Dog. Is that right? Okay, so, yeah, uh, whenever the Navy visits a, a foreign port, we're required to have a buddy. It's yep. the buddy system. You, you can't go anywhere without at least one buddy. And, 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 that's, and that's generally a local, or is that another, another uh, serviceman? No, a, another service member from okay. the ship. From the ship, gotcha. Yeah, so um, I, I actually, uh, going back to my past with drug and alcohol... I did not drink until I was 21 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I won't say that I never had a sip of something, but I didn't ever sit down and drink until right. I was 21. Okay. Um, and on the way over to Plymouth, England, uh, you know, I, I had turned 21, and I 
arrived in Plymouth, and I got off the ship with Mad Dog. Uh, we'll explain how he got that name later, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we found our way to a place called the Corner Pub, and it was a tri-level place, and we entered on, like, I, I think the second, I think we might have even entered on the third level. Yep. And uh, we're, we're in there, and we're hanging out, and we're having fun, and this young lady by the name of Karen walks up, and she starts talking to us because we're in we're in uniform, mm -hmm. so you know Plymouth, England is very friendly to us. So we wore our uniforms out there, and uh, everybody's fascinated by it. And she starts talking to us, and you know, all right, we'll hang out. And she takes us downstairs, and she introduces us to Boz, her boyfriend. Okay. And so, Boz is huge, and. Uh, or no, I'm sorry, Paul was her boyfriend. And he was big. And then Paul said, this is my mate, Boz. And Boz was even bigger. <laughs> Two huge guys. Right. And we're talking like 6'4", or something like that. You know, big guys. And very muscular. And we're talking to them, and it turns out they're British submariners. Okay. As big as they were, right. they, were they were on a submarine. <laughs> right. So, so uh, we're we're talking to them, and they're like, "Oh, you guys got to come out with us." So we left the corner pub, and we ended up hitting must have been at least three quarters of the bars and and clubs in <laughs> Plymouth. And at every door where there was somebody taking cash for entry, Paul just said, "You're not going to charge. You got to let them in. They're the party. They'll bring the party inside." And got us in for free at every club. Nice, nice. And we didn't pay for a drink the whole night. And so we finally decided to end the night, and we walked back to their flat. And, you know, they took us back to their home. And we're sitting around, and Paul says, So you're married. Let's call your wife. Oh, God. And I said, Well... It's expensive, but this was back in 1994. Yeah, the long distance calls. I oh yeah, it well, yeah, yeah, very expensive. I said yep. that's that's too much. You guys, no. And Paul's like, no, 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 I got it. Don't worry about it. We'll call her. What's her number? So he dials, and he ans You know, she answers the phone, and he starts talking to her, and he says, "This is Paul from England." And I'm, I'm really not trying to do an accent because I'm not, not good with accents. <laughs> but uh, he says, this is Paul from England. And she says, okay. And he says, I'm here with Bryce. And he's bloody pissed. He's bloody pissed. <laughs> and she said, what is he angry about? <laughs> because, again, 1994, was a, the, the world was much, much, much larger. You know, That's the, right. You didn't have the connections, so the language barrier, even the, the colloquial, it just, she didn't know what that meant. She was Midwest, you know, she yep. knew nothing. Yep. So she mis misinterpreted it, and she's like, let me talk to him. <laughs> and I, I got on the phone, and I'm like, no, no, I'm drunk. And she was still <laughs> mad at me, because I had never gotten drunk with her. But uh, yeah, of course, I was going to say, man, that, that could. <laughs> I, I lived in England for for four years and been there off and on my whole life. So it's like the uh, as I have an uncle in the Midland or he's passed now, but he used to say all the time, we are a common people separated by a common language. So I, uh, yes. you know, we, play, <laughs> we, we, uh, they play football on a pitch. We play, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> soccer on a, you know, the whole bit, there's so many of those. And so it's, but it's, it's always funny to see those, those, the slang. And like you said, you know, now with Netflix and TV and the office and all the British shows, you know, it's much more common for people to kind of pick up on those colloquialisms but you're right man back in that time there's there's there was none of that you know and right. you, that, i'm sure that five minute long distance call could have cost him 20 bucks or something you know what Easily. i mean it was it was expensive back then so that's funny man that's those are those are fun stories man for sure man so Absolutely. real quick the, yeah, the reason yeah, yeah, sure. the reason he was called mad dog we got off the ship and he immediately went to mm -hmm. mad dog 2020 oh and so that, and every, it continued on even, we, we dubbed him that in Plymouth because he just was, he was drinking that all night and he was laughing and he was goofy and he just, every port, that was what he grabbed. He was, uh, he was, he did the opposite route you did, uh, pre, pre England in terms of drinking. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, Mad Dog. Oh, we've all had our we've all had our bouts with Mad Dog at some point in our life. I didn't. I, I <laughs> no. You're better off for it. Trust me. <laughs> I I went straight to Bacardi. Uh, I wouldn't touch Bacardi today, but I I did. I Bacardi was my drink of choice. Bacardi and Coke. <laughs> That's funny. Um, well, let me. So you you wrote something here. I kind of want you to just to just expand on real quick. Uh, I I always ask about kind of misconceptions that you've encountered from uh, civilians and you know non-military folks. And you said uh, you if you can, I'll quote you here. You said that, that w- the biggest misconception that you've seen that war is the only thing that will mess you up. It is difficult for a civilian to understand just how different that li- the lifestyle is and the transition back to civilian life. And you know we hear a lot about obviously uh, and rightfully so, but combat and, and PTSD and stuff like that. But talk about that this kind of piqued my interest a little bit. So talk about that. Just just as a transition to civilian life. Absolutely. So for me, I, I don't think I even understood just how how difficult it would be. But uh, you know, you hear me talking about Mad Dog and and even other military members from other navies around the world and all of these other people and and these teams and and going to NDAX and. It's all about the collective. It's not about an individual at all. Right. I was mm-hmm. not an individual. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't a bad thing to me. I enjoyed being a part of the collective. It, it meant a lot to me that I could look around me and find a dozen people that would lay down their lives for me if it ever mm-hmm. became necessary. It meant a lot to me that... They would pick me up in the middle of the night if if something went wrong or that they would come over and drink with me because something happened with my wife. You know, all of those things. I always had somebody that was a phone call away to be able to lean on whenever necessary. And transitioning to civilian life, it instantly disappeared. At that mm. time. Now, mm-hmm. today we do a much better job of it. And okay. and I work hard to be a, a part of that as well. And I've reconnected with a lot of the my shipmates from the USS Angels. Oh, Tone. cool. Cool. And, you know, social media has definitely helped. But even beyond that, there's many, many organizations today that make transitioning a little bit easier. But at that time, it was VFW. And at that time, VFW was where all of the old guys drank and and smoked. And that wasn't me. I didn't fit in there. They were the ones that they did lose people on the battlefield, etc. And it just, I didn't fit there. So I didn't have anything. And I was completely lost. Mm. And I, I did enter a really deep depression and struggled to find my way out of it. Because you had that sense of purpose and direction and camaraderie and that thing, that type of thing. Absolutely, and I had yeah. no clue where to go from there. Interesting, and I'll, I'll, uh, we'll get right back to what you eventually did end up doing because I want to talk about that. But um, from that, at the end, did your I asked you kind of how your how your views changed from when you entered at eighteen, and obviously you grew up in in a, in a Navy family, so you were real, you were well steeped in in what the Navy and the military generally was about. But um, towards the end of your Navy career, did your, did your views change a little bit? Were they, were they strengthened in ways? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, I will never say that the United States of America is 100% correct 100% of the time. Right. But I will always, and I do mean always, back her. And I... In the beginning, I didn't necessarily understand what that meant, but throughout my career, there were there were people in charge of us, and even at the highest levels, President of the United States, that I did not always agree with, and I didn't, right. I definitely didn't agree with the way we handled or did not handle certain situations, and I questioned that openly. And I, I remember very distinctly at one point questioning why we weren't doing something about uh, something bad happening in, in, in our country. And I had a chief say, I don't mind you questioning it, 
but watch your language. That is the president of the United States, mm. and he is your commander in chief. And it was a, it was a, it was not a literal slap in the face, but it sure felt like it. And yeah. it woke me up, and I recognized, you know what? For one thing, I don't even, I think I know, but I have no freaking clue what he knew. That's right. So. I, I, it just woke me up and it made me start thinking because at that time I seriously doubted our leadership, but I had to assess my own, I had to look internally and go, okay, what are my biases here? Why do I believe that? And I, I trust very strongly today that there are enough checks and balances from the top down that we're going to do the best we can. Yeah. Amen. I agree a hundred percent. Well said. Yep. That's uh the older I've gotten, that's uh, it's tracks very much with what I've come to believe as well. And just how important those checks and balances are, you know? Uh, amen. Yeah. Yeah. That interesting. That's a, that's, I haven't got that answer before and that's a really good one, man. I, I it's a, it's a well thought out one, man. That's really cool. Um, so once you, once you got done and let's get back to now you're, you're finished, you're getting out, you're kind of in a funk and, for every, just for, so everybody knows, uh, you know, Bryce has his own business now, uh, food and wine cruise planners. Um, I'll put your, obviously put your link in, in the show, you know, in, in the show notes and everything. So people can check you out. You also have your own p- podcast, but take us to how you got there from the end of the Navy. So while I was in the Navy and, and even a little bit before I had been, I dabbled in retail and sales and, uh, while I was in the Navy, I actually, I'm sure most people have heard of something called Amway, especially yep. if you're from Central Florida, you know, it's That's everywhere. It. But yep. um, I dabbled with Amway and I found it wasn't really for me because I didn't, I wasn't interested in the multi-level aspect of it, but right. I did love a lot of the products and I liked selling some of the products and I got into some of the wholesaling and, and I sold to businesses, business to business. And I also sold cars for a while while I was in the Navy part time. And okay. so all of that sales, you know, when I got out and I couldn't figure out what to do, I was like, well, I, I know how to sell. Yep. So I managed to land a, well, actually I, I, I was, I needed to do something and we took a long vacation and then I came back and I applied to be a courier for a, a local business in Jacksonville, Florida. And I showed up at the interview wearing a full suit mm-hmm. and it was, you know, this back door of this warehouse and dingy and, you know, there's all these cars carrying tires and everything else. And she's like, are you really here to drive? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. She said, tell me about yourself. And she asked me some questions. She said, "Will you do our marketing. Interesting. And so I started with them and they were not letting go. They, they were holding on too tight to what they had been doing. Yeah. So I walked away and I launched my own career service and I was, I opened the very first bicycle messenger service in downtown Jacksonville, Florida called a New York minute. Okay. And, uh, I did that for a while and I stepped away to try to earn some money to feed that business and my partner couldn't handle it. And we finished out our contract and shut it down. So that was my very first real business. You know, I had the Amway business, but that was my first real business. And, um, and after that, I went into retail and I worked for Radio Shack and worked my way up to have my own store. And then Best Buy bought me away for you know better wages and less hours. I could spend more time with my family. And I looked above me and I couldn't see any place to go because I would have had to take a pay cut to take a, a manager position. So I went to school at SIU. Mm-hmm. Uh, Southern Illinois University, mm-hmm. Carbondale, Illinois. Carbondale, Carbondale yep. And I moved my entire family up there. And while I was there, I started out as going for engineering and it just wasn't me. And I gravitated towards the school of business and I went for marketing. And while I was there, I entered a pitch competition for, well, I had done a study abroad uh, and had a blast in Grenoble, France. And when I came back, 
my buddy and I were sitting across the table at a bar and we were waiting and waiting and waiting and we were frustrated because the server wasn't coming over to us. And we finally were talking about the fact that all of us were sitting across from each other holding phones. And we decided, you know what? Our phone needs to be, be able to order something. And uh, we decided to create a smartphone application that would allow you to scan a QR code and place an order for a product at a bar. Hmm. And I won a pitch competition. And from there, I dropped out of school and built a tech startup and earned, you know, raised a bunch of money and ran it as long as I could. And in the Midwest, that wasn't very long. So, right. you know, I, I should have gone to Silicon Valley. I should have picked up and gone there. But, you know, family I was going to say, stuff. man, that's the <laughs> – come out here, man. That yeah. Was, the... <laughs> and it was early. It, we yeah, were both right. too early and too late to be able yep. to do what we needed to do. And yep. I shut it down, and I moved down here to Orlando because my, my father had passed and my mom was down here alone. And my parents had become avid cruisers uh, by the time – we buried my mom at sea. It had been 52, 53 cruises, something like that. Wow. Um, and I, I had the passion for being all over the world. And I decided, that, you know what? I'm, I'm going to buy a franchise. So I bought a Cruise Planners franchise. Cruise Planners is a 25-year-old company. And uh, belying the name, we actually do land and sea. The Cruise right. Planners is actually number one for beaches and, and secrets resorts. Okay. Uh, so we do a lot of land, but, uh, I bought that franchise and I wanted our focus to be food because we're huge foodies. And so very recently with COVID, you know, nobody's traveling. I decided, you know what, let's talk about it. So right. we started something called travel Tuesdays for foodie fans and we interview people in different vocations, but definitely in, uh, the food industry. And we, ask them you know where in the world they've traveled and how they find the very best in food and wine nice so Get to that's do what a, we're doing a, now anthony bourdain from your home i'm working on it yeah yeah you, <laughs> you and me both brother well tell tell so tell everybody how they can find you i, I mentioned the name of your four but why don't you tell everybody uh, where they can find you so our website is food and wine cruise planners dot com and i i of course am on uh facebook and and other uh, social media at very similar food and wine cruise planners dot com or uh, at food and wine cruise planners, and then uh, of course you can find our podcast at food and wine cruise planners dot com slash podcast. Nice, nice man. Well, cool man. I, I uh, so everybody go check that out again. I'll I'll put that link in the show, uh, in the show notes, man. And um, and yeah, Bryce, I really want to uh, thank you for for joining, coming on, man, and, and telling your story, man absolutely thank you it's yeah. been a pleasure yeah absolutely man all right uh again one more time before we head out of here food and wine food and wine cruise planners.com check it out you go there i've been to his site he does a video podcast you know video simulcast as well so it's it's pretty fun man i've, I've checked out a few of his episodes so check that out as well so uh if that's about it man bryce thanks a lot for your time man. i really enjoyed talking to you man you got it thank you all right, all right.